Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, if you'd like to support the podcast and the channel, you can through Patreon. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Canada has something about non-nuclear explosions. We have the famous Halifax explosion of 1917 that released the equivalent of 2.9 kilotons of TNT and was the largest man-made explosion prior to the development of nuclear weapons. But this isn't what this piece is about. This video is about another famous explosion that many in Canada have forgotten about. It is the Ripple Rock Explosion, and it is one of the largest non-nuclear explosions to ever happen. First, a bit of background on Ripple Rock itself. This underwater mountain sits at the Seymour Narrows along the Discovery Passage in British Columbia. Close to Campbell River, it presents a significant hazard to boats coming through the area. George Vancouver wrote in his diary in 1792 that it was one of the vilest stretches of water in the entire world. Over the years, many ships would hit the rock that was only a few feet below the water at low tide. The eddies there formed by tidal currents around the rock also presented a significant hazard to ships. Named by Captain Richards because of the standing waves that its summits made as the tidal current moved through the strait, it would continue to prey on ships until 1958. More on that later though. The first large ship to ever hit the rock was the USS Saranac, which crashed into it in 1875 on its way to Alaska. From that point until 1958, 20 large ships and 100 small ships were sunk or badly damaged on the rock, and it's known at least 110 people drowned in the accidents caused by the rock. One such ship was the USS Wachuset, which passed through the narrows during a strong ebb and began caught in an extremely large whirlpool. This caused it to strike heavily on Ripple Rock, losing a large portion of its false keel and splintering heavily. As soon as the first ship hit the rock in the 1800s, it was decided that the rock had to go, and an explosion of a monumental proportion was needed. One plan had a bridge being built to connect Vancouver Island with Blue Inlet, using the rock as a support, but that was abandoned in the 1860s in favour of eventually destroying the rock. In 1931, a Canadian Marine Commission recommended removing the rock completely, but it would be over a decade until the government gave permission to do so. The first attempt to destroy the rock with explosives was in 1943. Floating drilling barges were tasked with drilling into the rock to blast it to pieces. This approach was abandoned quickly as the cables tended to break every 48 hours. In 1945, another attempt was made using two large overhead steel lines, but this was abandoned when only 93 of the 1500 controlled explosions were successful. In 1953, the National Research Council of Canada commissioned a feasibility study on planting explosive charges underneath the peaks of the rock. Three companies, Northern Construction Company, J.W. Stewart Limited, and Boyles Brothers Drilling Company were granted the contract worth $3 million. The United Kingdom's Atomic Weapons Research Establishment was very interested in this explosion, as it was going to be a very large, non-nuclear explosion. From November 1955 to April 1958, 75 men working in three shifts built a 500-foot vertical shaft from Maud Island and a 2,300-foot long horizontal shaft to the base of Ripple Rock. Two more shafts were built from the Twin Peaks. A total of 1,270 metric tons of Nitromex 2H explosives were then used. This was 10 times what would have been used for an explosion above water. There were worries by some that it would destroy Campbell River 40 kilometers away, while some worried that a tsunami would hit Japan, or that millions of fish would die. A few people theorized that it would even cause the big one, an earthquake many in British Columbia have been expecting for years. On April 5, 1958 at 9.31 am, the explosion took place. A total of 635,000 metric tons of rock and water were displaced by the explosion. Rocks and debris were thrown a thousand feet in the air. The blast was large enough that it cleared 45 feet of vertical rock, providing ships with plenty of room to go over it. While it was a very large explosion, there was almost no noise as the water muffled the majority of it. As for the destructive aspects, there was a brief 25 foot tsunami and a few fish did die, but that was it. The only damage that was reported was to the wall clock and a mining clock on Quadra Island. 
The RCMP were on hand for the explosion to ensure that no one would be anywhere within three miles of the explosion. TV crews and engineers were housed in a bunker, and the explosion is now a national historic event, and it was seen live on CBC television coast to coast. It is one of the first live coast to coast television broadcasts in Canadian history. Today, as many as 20 large cruise ships a day sail past Campbell River during the peak cruise season because of that explosion. I hope you enjoyed that look at the Ripple Rock explosion, and if you did, please give a like and maybe even share the video. You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.com, you can visit my website which is canadaehx.com, and you can subscribe to my podcast. I release three episodes a week on Canadian history. It's called Canadian History X, and it's on most major podcast platforms. And you can become a patron for as little as $3 a month, like these wonderful people have. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.